In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So these readings fall on last week's readings and directs us toward a right action. Last week, they mentioned the, the, at, at length the law. And this, this week, uh, then, then going deeper into that, the, the, similar, the same speech of Christ, looking then at, at charity in a deeper way and what that looks like. Charity is something we, we speak about a lot. It, it comes up a lot in Scripture, and it's something that's spoken a lot about in, in certainly the rites of the church and even in preaching, especially here among the, the Dominicans at this particular ambo, I suppose. And it may be good to consider what charity is exactly and what that virtue is. You know what it's not here, and often that's how it's laid out even in Scripture. It's not simply being nice. It's not kindness alone. It's not almsgiving. It's, it's not friendship only. It's, it's something else. When we speak about charity or when we use love, we're not talking about human love. We're speaking about love in general. In the church, we're speaking about the virtue of charity. And that's rooted in the law. So this teaching goes together. The law and charity are very much connected. In Deuteronomy, we have the, the passage, fear the Lord and walk in His ways and love Him. So this love is united to the keeping of the law. Love is that right action. So what is charity? Charity, we recall, is a virtue. And what are the virtues? Well, first we can look at the natural virtues. There are prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. These things you can have without faith. These, these are, are virtues that, that someone could have for courage or balance. When one is baptized, these same virtues you get, there's our natural virtues, but these, these similar virtues called the supernatural virtues are infused here. And so you get a Christian temperance, fortitude, etc. So that gives the strength for the Christian to witness to their faith or even die a martyr or to make the superhuman sacrifices necessary in a Christian vocation or in, in growth and holiness, which is different or, or, or stronger, greater than just those natural virtues. The theological virtues of faith, hope, and love are, do not, though they can kind of, they seem to exist before baptism, but when we speak about the true theological virtues, they do not exist until baptism at the point which they are infused. Because these are rooted in the connection in Christ made in baptism. So that the reception, the receiving of the Holy Spirit, the receiving and union with the Lord are what make those theological virtues work. They are given with the gift of Christ and the Holy Spirit. They are their works. They, like the incarnation, because of the incarnation, because of baptism, then can only exist when that bridge of union in Christ exists in our union in the body. Because faith, hope, and love are, again, are not very much more, in this sense, not human fidelity, hopefulness, and, and, and kindness, but directed towards the, the object, the goal, the end, which is God. Always. Faith, hope, love. Faith in God, hope in the salvation God offers, love of God and neighbor. Those are the theological virtues given and only then are at work then in baptism. Virtues, we have to remember the opposite of vices. And vices, again, are easy to understand Easier, I think, uh, vices, and we know that there's the, the primary vices, the principal vices, and those are bad habits. They're not just sins, they are bad habits. One can act upon one of the vices individually, unfortunately, but a vice is a habitual sin, especially when the, those, those seven, the habitual sin then that we've worked on and developed so that we become good at it and it's hard to get out of it. So of of, uh, of of say say lust or, or anger, right? So the virtues are are not only the opposite of these theologically or philosophically, but actually, you know, the, the virtues are good habits. And so when we speak about faith, hope, and love, they, they we do receive them in their fullness in baptism, but we don't act with them well. 
It's like receiving a gift. Here's your clarinet. Here's your bicycle. You know, at first we need to learn how to use it before we learn, it, to, learn to do it well. You have to practice with it before then it, it, it actually is an easy thing to use. And so faith, hope, and love, though we receive the fullness of this virtue, need to be practiced in our life. And not just once or twice, all our life. So especially charity is something that we practice all of our life. In the Gospel of Matthew, we know well when, when Jesus quotes back Deuteronomy, and he'll say, when he's asked, what, are the greatest, what is the greatest commandment? And he says, you shall love the Lord your God with your whole heart, with your whole soul, and with your whole mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Here the law and the Lord puts into order. And this is, the order is important. Now that's a different homily. <laughs> order is important. So you have God, neighbor, self. That order is very important. But for today, we know that here he he speaks about God first. That precept of charity, love God first and neighbor. The virtue of charity is also a precept of God, a commandment. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Or, at the Last Supper, he'll say, I give you a new commandment. Love one another, which he expounds really earlier on in the gospel passage we've heard today, here's what love means, love your brother. I said it same last week, love your brother. <clears throat> so God first and neighbor second. But the two are very much connected. So that this friendship with God and this path to be really free human persons, full Christians, are then taught in Scripture. <clears throat> We, of course, see as we cannot love uh, our neighbor in the same way as ourselves, but, but it, it's different. But what the Lord is, is pointing out here is then the fact that we should... Well, how is it that we love ourselves? Because we know that sometimes we love ourselves too much, or sometimes, unfortunately, not enough. And so the Lord here is speaking about a certain kind of self-preservation, or our own desire, I hope, for ourselves than to encounter and be with the Lord, to seek God in heaven and the life to come. And this is the love. When we talk about the, the, the virtue of charity, this is the love that we should have then for, for those who are for anyone. That when we, when we desire the good for that person and will their good, it is for their salvation always. And one cannot say one loves another if that is missing. It's just pure selfishness. If you do not work for the salvation of another person, you do not love them. Now that might mean you really like them. Or not. But, we desire salvation. And, and we always mention what? The book of Job. We can relate to Job. Or Jonah, rather. Who goes and preaches. We can relate to Job, too. But Jonah... So I don't want to preach to these people. But we see that working in him. We see, no, no. He, he does will the good of the Ninevites. And he prays for them and prays for their salvation. Well, the, one of the basic social principles of the church based on the commandments of Christ is to, is to not only will the good of the other, but to work for that common good. And when we, we're talking about the common good, certainly we mean some physical things, but here more especially salvation. This is what motivated St. Dominic in southern France. He sees these people in poverty. And he says, he doesn't say at first, no, it wouldn't be a bad question, but he doesn't say, how do I alleviate their poverty? He says, why are they poor? And he discovers, because they are not on the path of salvation. St. Teresa of Avila teaches us that the surest way to determine whether one possesses the love of God is to see the weather they love their neighbor. These two loves are never separated. Rest assured, the more you progress in love of neighbor, the more your love of God will increase. The two we know are united, and, and each one of us are better in one aspect, maybe. Better in our prayer life. Better in that love of God. Better in keeping the commandments. And some of us are better in the precepts of charity towards our neighbor and find the other more difficult, you know. So it just depends but the two must come together. And St. Thomas Aquinas 
most especially to speak on the way the charity is exercised and that love of God, prayer and union with Him, and then that work of charity described in the recent scriptures of how one treats their, their neighbor. And that is not, as Paul puts it simply, not or to cease rendering a curse and begin to render a blessing. Charity is something that we know is broken in the soul in mortal sin. And why is that? Because love is broken. Because that bond of love is broken. Not the love of God, but our love. That's why even an ancient term, it's not a new one, ancient term with confession, penance, and reconciliation. Because as St. Thomas Aquinas says, there is a reconciliation, of course, to God and neighbor in confession. That mortal sin severs that tie and causes then a break in that bond of love. And this is why we can't do anything meritorious when we're in mortal prayer, at least spiritually speaking, because we're not united with God. As St. Catherine calls in the, the as Catherine of Siena calls the state of grace, sanctifying grace, also the state of divine love. We're not connected and we must be reunited to the Lord in this, in this way to begin to be united with Him. Sometimes we're confused by that because of the love of God that does continue. But it's not the virtue of faith that continues, excuse me, the vir- virtue of charity that continues in mortal sin. It's faith, and that's what will save us. The faith then, even in our suffering, even our sin, that brings us back to be reconciled with the Lord. Faith is the last virtue then to dis- dispiate in, in, in the face of sin. And so faith is often that thing that saves us. That's why we pray in the Mass, look not upon our, our sins, O Lord, but upon the faith of your church. So the Lord then giving us then these commandments to, to love. The virtue of charity leads us then to the Lord. And the virtue of charity really should, should form all other human actions, should really be at the root, directing us then towards the Lord. St. Augustine points out that the, the charity can never be perfect in this life. I know the scriptures that say, be holy as your Lord God is holy, be perfect as he is perfect. But this perfection is something that we're aiming towards and can never be perfect in this life because there's still concupiscence in us. There's still that tendency to sin. Even the greatest saints, they're still sinning a a bit in mind and thought. If you've read a biography uh, of, say, even St. Faustino, you'll find her struggling, perhaps with smaller, much smaller sins compared to ours, but struggling with sin. Her, she's not perfect and will not be perfect then until she enters the heavenly life. Now, the virtue of charity, the Lord keeps laying this out. He says, Paul says it's the virtue that will endure. Where faith and hope will pass away, charity will endure. We are ever to grow in charity in this life. And and it's centered very much around Holy Communion. And in in a sense, we can see that preparation and living out the greatest commandments around Holy Communion. We are not worthy to receive the Lord in Holy Communion, but He makes us worthy, and we prepare our hearts and our minds to receive Holy Communion in, in our preparation, in prayer, in faith, and in keeping His commandments. We receive Holy Communion, as the Fathers tell us, at, at, that our charity should grow in us in receiving Communion, but it's not that reception alone, it's the work we do to prepare So charity grows because then we receive Him with faith and that gift of His grace, that union with Him will grow. Charity grows. That that virtue is at work in the most wonderful way. And finally, we take then that which we've received into the world, that witness of Christ and that presence of Christ. So charity works very much with our reception and our union with the Lord in Holy Communion. And this is to ever grow throughout our life. I know we always say, let's be the last person in, into heaven, or purgatory, as people say, the very last person. Okay, and maybe that's my hope too, for myself, sure. But the degree to which we live charity on this earth will correspond to our life in the next. That's a doctrine often ignored. Why do you have this hierarchy of the saints? Because of what they did? Because they're mentioned in Scripture? No, because of union with the Lord, because of the degree of of charity as work within them. 
Did Our Lady, is she the closest? Will she be the closest when we see the Trinity? Will she be the closest to the Lord because of what she did? Yes. But more because of her union in charity. Because she was conceived without sin and grows exponentially in charity throughout her life. Something that's not possible for us, but that growth is important. We will, we will participate in the divinity of Christ to the extent in which we grew in charity on this earth. So what we do here directly affects not only our salvation, but the way we will live for all eternity. And so, listen, commend our, ourselves to the Lord this day and, 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 and hear those words to love our neighbor as ourself. And remember the greatest commandment that the Lord puts out for us. You shall love the Lord your God with your heart, your whole soul, your whole mind, and your neighbor as yourself. This is the precepts of God. This is the path to salvation. Not simply be nice to neighbor, but to love. To love as God, as the Lord in his earthly life taught us to love. To love God and to love others. That all then will hear his call and love him in return. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.